Ken McElroy here, and I'm here with my good friend, Jason Hartman. Welcome back to the show, Jason. For those of you guys who may not know, um, I, I talk a lot about commercial. Jason's an expert for single families, so I can't wait to talk to you, Jason, because I know you pour yourself into these single family markets and demographics. Uh, you have some great stuff on cyclical, hybrid, and linear markets, and, and you've been tracking appreciation by market because... There's a big bifurcation happening right now between, you know, what's going on in commercial is bad, but what's going on in single family doesn't appear to be as bad. So let's jump right in uh, to that. And so what are you seeing right now in, in, the res in the single family residential markets? Yeah, Kenny, you know, you're so right. That's such a good point that you make because the old saying in real estate is all real estate is local all real estate is local. So that's really important to understand. But it's also important to understand that you have to look at the category, right? That the different type of asset class, commercial, residential, within commercial, are you talking about retail, office, warehouse, and industrial, or, you know, or what, right? And then within residential, you have to segment between price, obviously location, because all real estate is local, product type, you know, you can be in the same geography and the high end market will be performing very differently than the low end and the middle end, right? So everybody has to really just understand they've got to peel back the layers of the onion. There are many layers. If you were looking at automobiles, for example, the market for Ford is different than the market for Tesla, okay? These are just different things. And the same is true with real estate. Painting things with a broad brush like real estate or even residential real estate is way too broad. As far as geographically, there are about 400 metropolitan areas in the United States. It's a huge country. There are over 3,000 counties. There are over 9,000 cities and countless neighborhoods. All real estate is local. But the one thing we can do is I think we can divide up the country and the way we look at it by three major types of markets. And those are linear markets, cyclical, and hybrid markets, as you were alluding to. Can you walk through what each market represents? Absolutely can. And I'll just share some visual aids for those who are watching on video right now. Three major types of markets. Linear markets are the slow and steady markets. As you were saying, Ken, that's the kind of set it and forget it type of market. You know, markets with good cash flow, they always have low land values, these markets, and a high improvement value as a ratio to the overall value. And I'll explain why that's important if you want to go into it deeper. And then there's cyclical markets. If you're looking at a chart of appreciation or depreciation over time, these cyclical markets look like a roller coaster. They're up, they're down, they have glorious highs, ugly lows. And they're exciting and interesting. And the news media likes to report on them a lot because there's something to talk about, okay? And then there's the hybrid markets that are in between the two. So let's talk about some examples of these three markets, okay? So linear markets are most of the country and most of the world. Hybrid markets are markets that are in between linear and cyclical. In the US, those would represent places like Denver and Austin, okay? Phoenix used to be a hybrid market. Nowadays, I would really call it a cyclical market, frankly. And then cyclical markets are the sort of the trophy markets, usually. They're places like Miami, New York, Washington, D.C., Boston, on the other side, Los Angeles, San Diego, San Francisco, Orange County, places I'm from in Southern California, up where you're from in Seattle, okay? These are the markets that have bigger fluctuations and bigger swings. And cyclical markets, remember, you can always tell a cyclical market because it's going to be an expensive market. It's going to have high land values, but it's going to have low cash flow, very bad cash flow in cyclical markets. So here is Memphis. Memphis is a linear market. It's boring. We've helped hundreds and hundreds of investors buy in Memphis over the years. I've owned many properties in Memphis myself, and not much happens. It's just a market with a high renter population, good cash flow, and it just kind of chugs along in terms of appreciation. Nothing too extraordinary. Same is true with Indianapolis, another market I've owned many properties in, and we've helped hundreds and hundreds of clients buy properties in Indianapolis over the years. 
boring linear market. Okay. Just kind of chugs along. Contrast that with where I grew up, which is Los Angeles, California. <laughs> and look at the difference in this chart. It's a roller coaster, man. It's just crazy ups and downs. And these markets are much more speculative. If you think you're an investor in a cyclical market, you're probably not. You're more of a speculator and a gambler. And hey, sometimes you make money speculating and gambling. So I don't fault it. I'm just saying that understand it's not really investing, at least by my definition, probably yours or even Warren Buffett's definition. I mean, look, it's like the old tale of the tortoise and the hare. Okay. One is fast and one's a sprinter and the sprinter runs out of energy and can't finish the race. But the one that's slow and steady and reliable finishes the race and in my opinion, usually wins the race. Okay. I know it's easy to be envious of people who've made profits in cyclical markets during boom times, but what you don't often hear is how they're hurting and losing their shirt during the downtimes. You know, people love to talk about their successes, but they tend to hide their failures and sweep them under the rug. So, you know, that's that's one of the things about it. And, and you know, before we started, you were looking at this map and asking me about it. I'll just show this to you. This illustrates the point. Even in this market where we've seen the cost of money basically triple. I mean, this is insane, these interest rate increases we've had. And they have hit the cyclical markets. Because look at here, if you look at the, the western side of the U.S., and this is the Federal Housing Finance Agency, the FHFA, the stats for the past year, okay? Those markets are down, not by much though, amazingly, okay? Only down by 2.35%. Some of these western states, Arizona, Nevada, and the rest, right? They're down by 0 0.06, not much. But the rest of the country faring actually quite well. <laughs> I mean... It's like the most resilient asset class. I, I can't believe that real estate has just held up to essentially an attack by the Federal Reserve. Yeah, so let's hold on this chart real quick because I think this is really, really important. When you're looking at this, is this is a one-year snapshot. And these are appreciation values based on, let's, you know, the negative 2.35. That's Washington, Oregon, California all in, right? So people are going to argue with this and go, wow, you know, my little market, you know, in Stockton or, or yeah. you know, San Diego has done, you know, better than this. That might be true, but this is collectively those three combined, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, look, there's a lot of geography in those markets, right? These are big swaths. It's very hard to talk about the United States as a housing market. It drives me nuts when I turn on the news media and someone's talking about the housing market, and I can't figure out where that is. I don't know if it's in LA, Miami, Memphis, Indiana. You know, it's, it's just too big a country to talk like that. The stretch to get a home now, you know, which the housing prices, I think, were yeah, the average is of six, seven hundred thousand. Yeah. Um, you know, at, at 7%, there's just no possible. Oh, not even right. close. Right. right. Not even close. So, so, where do you think all this is headed? Because it sure to me looks like. Reds, to your point, it feels to me like reds are going to start to suck up underneath these oh, yeah. these higher mortgage prices. And, and uh, we haven't seen anything yet for rent growth. No, I totally agree. I think, or look at what always happens in every cycle. And look, I've been doing this for decades now. I've seen the cycles. I've experienced them personally. I've seen them play out over and over. And what happens every single time is you have cheaper money come into the market it floods the market, it puts pushes the prices up, and the rents always lag the prices. They're very slow. The rents lag by about three years. So it takes a while for the rents to catch up. And, you know, if you want to understand the dynamic of that, just think about it, okay? In any neighborhood, when you're in a hot market and prices are going up quickly and there's multiple offers, look, we've all, we all just experienced that to absolute you know, craziness levels. And some markets are still experiencing it now, okay? In every time you have every house that comes on the market is more expensive than the last one. And every seller's expectations are up in the clouds. Hey, look, that house down the street sold. My house is better than that, of course. And so, you know, I'm going to price it for, you know, 30 grand more than that one. And they're going to get it, right? 
And so those prices climb with every comp, but leases or rents are on a one-year lease most of the time. And so they cycle much more slowly. And you always see the rents lag the prices. So that's a, one reason you know that rents are too cheap. Another reason you know rents are too cheap is just look at household formation. I mean, you've got the millennials that are the biggest demographic cohort in American history. It's 80 million people. And they are about six years behind schedule as far as forming families, getting married, having kids, buying a house. But they're finally moving into the market. I mean, millennials are not kids anymore. The oldest millennial is 42 years old now. Okay. And so they're now doing their thing. And as they get into the market, they are pushing up prices. They are pushing up rents. And there's just no housing available. I, I mean, the amount of inventory we have, and I'll show you some charts on this in a moment, is just despicably low. And it's not an easy problem to solve. It's a big problem. And it's not going to solve itself anytime soon. That's what people have to realize. First, let's understand the lock-in effect, okay? And this is the cheap mortgages that most of the country has. So about 25% of the country has a mortgage at or below 3%. 65% of the country has a mortgage at or below 4%. One of the things that's really hard for people to understand is this idea. And when the crash bros are out there talking about how the market's going to crash, right? They're just missing so many important points. Every time interest rates go up, the existing mortgages that are held by people that refied or purchased during the COVID era, when we had the lowest rates in 5,000 years, these people have a house that every time they see mortgage rates go up higher, that house becomes more valuable to them because yeah. their mortgage is so cheap in comparison and so irreplaceable like a family heirloom that they're just not going to sell it, right? They're going to keep it. And what this chart doesn't tell you is that about 40% of the country has no mortgage at all. So the one ingredient, as I always say, you absolutely must have, that you cannot have a real estate crash without this one ingredient, and that is millions of distressed sellers. You absolutely must have that ingredient or you can't bake that cake. You can't have a real estate crash without millions of distressed sellers. So let's look at housing inventory. Right now, we have inventory that has been creeping up. About five, 500,000 homes are for sale in the United States. Now, keep in mind, compared to what is always the right question. Well, we have about 140 million housing units. So this is nothing. Nothing is for sale. <laughs> I mean, it's just nothing. Inventory is urgently low still. Now, it got much lower savagely lower during the COVID era, where I reported at one of the events where we were both speakers, okay, uh, I believe that was in Houston, I reported that inventory was only 244,000 homes. So it has definitely increased. But where is it normally? It would normally be at about 1.2 million homes. Right. So we are short by 700,000 homes shortage. Now, I do need to say something too. The stats I'm using are from Altos. A lot of people use the stats from the National Association of Realtors, and that's fine, as long as you compare apples to apples. Just understand that NAR counts the pending and contingent sales as well as the active listings. We're only counting active listings. So NAR numbers are higher, but it's counting differently. At our collective meeting that we had in Park City recently, you and George and I were on stage, and I gave this metaphor, which I... or yeah, analogy, metaphor, I think it's a metaphor, um, <laughs> that I think is good. And it is the kitchen sink. So if everybody listening just pictures their kitchen sink for a minute and think about if your sink were full of water, if the basin were entirely full to the brim, we'd call that a normal market. A bad market or a buyer's market would be where the water is overflowing. Okay, so normal is a full sink. So right now, your sink, if you're comparing it to the market, is about 40% full. It's 60% empty. All right? That's the amount of inventory we have. Let's look at two more components. Let's look at the faucet. The faucet represents new homes coming on the market. And the faucet is just trickling. Barely, barely anything is coming on the market. 
It's just a trickle, hardly anything. And the drain represents the buyer demand, or as you would call it in your world, the absorption rate. Okay. And so that is how many buyers are buying properties. Now, the Fed has killed demand as best it could, and it still hasn't really killed it. But demand is down by about 20% if you sort of average it across markets, right? So the drain, if it were a booming market like we had, the drain would be fully open. Right now, it's about 20% clogged, okay? Less demand. And the, the faucet is at a trickle, and the basin of the sink is only 40% full. That's where we are. We are simply in a massive shortage. Now, it probably won't last forever, but there's a lot of evidence saying that it'll last a long time. And that's because of the lock-in effect of the sellers that don't want to sell and have no motivation to sell and aren't distressed because they basically went into a time machine. And I'll just show you maybe this one final thing before we wrap it up. Here are the mortgage payments. These are median mortgage payments compared to median home sales prices at various times over the last decade or so, okay? So back in 2011, the median home price was about 225, okay? And the mortgage payment on that house would have been about $1,000 a month. Now, as of you know, last year when they started hiking rates, that mortgage payment about doubled to over 2,000 a month for a house that was more than double, $471,000, right? But that's not what matters. What matters is what happened over the past couple of years when the whole country either bought a house or refinanced a house. Those people basically got into a time machine and went back 10 years in time. They basically got their mortgage payment for $1,000, just like you would have 10 years earlier. That hardly ever happens. And these are the people that need to have distress if you want to have a crash. What about the elephant in the room? What about unemployment? Unemployment insurance lasts for 26 weeks, half a year, six months, basically, right? And that's if they don't extend it. During times of crisis, they always extend it, enhance it, yada, yada. But just assume it lasts for six months like it does today. And it varies a lot by state and by income and all of this, right? But I talked to my CPA about this. I had him do some research because I kind of found it hard to figure this out. But basically, if you are getting about $2,300 a month in unemployment insurance, okay, you could literally qualify for the mortgage most people currently have based on your debt to income ratio. You could get the loan today on the what's called the DTI, the debt to income ratio, there's a front end and a back end DTI that lenders qualify you on. And literally on unemployment insurance, someone would technically qualify based on their debt to income ratio. Now, that doesn't mean a lender will give you a loan if you're unemployed because they won't, okay? But their debt to income ratio, meaning could they afford the house? Yes, they could. It's under 36%. And under 50% back end, front end, okay? They can afford their house on unemployment insurance. And the other thing I'd like to say about that, Ken, is that we live in a world today where employment is a much different concept than it used to be. Everybody you know has a side hustle. They're doing something online where they're making a few bucks. You know, they're driving for Uber or Lyft, making a few bucks. They're doing like all of these different things with Fiverr, with TaskRabbit, with just, a, there's a million ways to earn money and still be considered unemployed, okay? And that's the other thing people have to understand is that people nowadays a lot more have some side income that they're making some money from. Jason, as always, man, thanks for a wealth of knowledge. I love, I listen to you. I love uh, your perspective on stuff. You've been right so far. 